Across the country, all eyes are on Washington, as the special counsel's report is in the hands of Congress. The stakes are high, but they've been set before. Let's turn the historical lens on investigations of the past and see what sticks when special counsels take the stage. Let's rewind all the way back to 1972. Richard Nixon is president, and the Washington Post breaks its first legendary story on the Watergate scandal. Five held in plot to bug Democrats' office at Watergate building. When we look back, it often seems like once this story broke, the writing was already on the wall for Nixon, but that wasn't really the case. There was kind of a constant drip, drip of headlines for a while, but much like the stories of Russian interference in the 2016 election, these stories didn't really have a huge impact on Nixon's re election campaign at the time. But as we know, that would soon change. The time has come to bring that investigation and the other investigations of this matter to an end. I want to highlight some key players here. In his 1973 confirmation hearing to be attorney general, Elliot Richardson promised he would appoint a special prosecutor to look into Watergate. And now that's really where the modern history of the role special prosecutor begins. He appoints Archibald Cox who subpoenaed the infamous tape recordings Nixon made of his conversations in the Oval Office. Now, Nixon fires Cox, and in response, Elliot Richardson resigns. And that comes to be known as the Saturday Night Massacre. There was a lot of public outcry over this, so Nixon appoints a new special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, a Nixon supporter and Watergate skeptic. It's not that I wanted to become involved in it. Of course, as an American citizen, I think all of us are involved. Now, I want to dig into our video archive to see how this all played out very publicly. Nixon may have thought that appointing Jaworski would help his case, and he famously said this at a press conference about the Watergate scandal and an investigation into unpaid income taxes. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. But Watergate hearings continued on into 1974. And in June of that year, Jaworski named Nixon an unindicted co-conspirator in the Watergate case. And cue the frenzy. I have always responded where I thought that I could render a, a particular service, some special service to my country. Uh, this was a call to duty. Like Mueller today, Jaworski couldn't or wouldn't indict a sitting president. But still, that moved the needle on impeachment from unlikely to inevitable. And in August of 1974, Nixon resigned. This is NBC Nightly News. Good evening. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. The nation awaits the swearing in at noon Eastern time of our 38th president, Gerald Ford. And we will have uh, fuller details on this momentous story in just a moment, a story that many of us are still having trouble believing actually occurred. Now, there have been a lot of comparisons between Mueller and Watergate, but there's actually a more recent use of the independent counsel that's informing the way Democrats in Congress are handling this Mueller thing in a pretty big way. And that is the Ken Starr investigation during the Clinton presidency. Few have ventured that the president told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in his civil case and before the grand jury. Bill Clinton had just beat George H.W. Bush, but he never quite cleared up some controversies stemming from some real estate investments that he and his wife Hillary made back in Arkansas. And that became known as the Whitewater Controversy. And we were trying to get the relevant facts, the full story, to the House of Representatives. So Bill Clinton takes office, but the Whitewater controversy doesn't really go away. So a panel of judges appoints Ken Starr as independent counsel to look into the whole thing. But Starr can also look into other criminal matters that come across his desk. And he discovers allegations of sexual misconduct against Clinton from when he was governor of Arkansas. And that leads to information about a young woman who had an affair with President Clinton while she was a White House intern. And that, of course, is Monica Lewinsky. 
The White House is shaken. The President of the United States forced to answer charges of improper relations with a 21-year-old intern. This is more than an allegation of just another Washington scandal. He said, she said, they said. And those are the allegations that ultimately became Clinton's big scandal. And the world watched really closely. I dug through a bunch of old magazines. During his first sexual encounter with Monica Lewinsky, they were fondling each other in a darkened hallway next to the Oval Office. He invited her into his small study when the telephone ring. And this I will not repeat on television. I mean, take a look at this. This was some pretty R-rated stuff. Actually, maybe even X-rated. But this was released to the public. This was in Ken Starr's report that Congress said the public is welcome to read. And just like today, late night comedy skewered the whole thing. Hello? <laughs> hey. Hi, Monica. <laughs> She became a household name, and back then, way before the Me Too movement, she was villainized. And President Clinton famously denied the affair ever happened. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. His denials turned into a case of perjury and obstruction of justice, leading to his impeachment by the Republican-controlled House of Representatives in 1998. Clinton ultimately was acquitted by the Senate. I want to say again to the American people, how profoundly sorry I am. What's interesting, though, is that during the Starr investigation, Clinton's approval ratings actually went up. Now, today, Democrats in Congress, like Nancy Pelosi, who was around when the Starr investigation was happening, are being really cautious about throwing around the word impeachment when it comes to President Trump. Today, the Republican majority is not judging the president with fairness, but impeaching him with a vengeance. I'm going to give a call to Jess Marsden. She's from Protect Democracy. They're a nonpartisan organization that just released a report looking at past independent prosecutors. When Starr testified before Congress, he was very much in the mode of presenting reasons that the president should be impeached. I think we are extremely unlikely to see anything like that. So going back even further, back to Watergate, how similar are some of those circumstances back then and what we're seeing right now? Some of the most shocking facts in the Mueller report and some of the most shocking facts that came out in the Watergate investigation were related to the president abusing their power to protect themselves. I think another key lesson, though, is that these investigations shouldn't just be about impeachment. Congress should take an opportunity to let Legislate. After Watergate, one of the most lasting legacies of that period is that Congress passed a range of statutes that were intended to curb the abuses of power that the Watergate investigation documented. So looking ahead to Robert Mueller's public testimony, it's unclear what will happen. History shows us that special counsels are a special but unpredictable threat. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.